was really kind of the foundations. Uh, what is, how did God create us? What does God design us for? The universal call to holiness, etc., etc. Tonight, uh, we're going to take a look at conscience. What is conscience? How do we form our conscience? Uh, and what is sin, then, when we choose contrary to our conscience? So let us begin with just a brief prayer. And in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to guide us, especially in our consciences, that we may truly hear your voice and do what is right and good always. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So last time in our journey together, we talked about uh, being created in the image and likeness of God. And the most significant aspect of that was that being created in God's image and likeness is that our spiritual being is like God. That we are created with an intellect. We're created with freedom. We're created with the ability to choose and decide and to reason and all of those good things. Intellect, memory, and will are the three powers of the soul. So we talk about the body as having five powers. The power of sight and smell and taste and hearing and touch. Those are the five powers of the body. That's how our body knows the world around it. The soul has three powers. Intellect, our ability to reason and think. Memory, our ability to store things and call them back. And will, our ability to choose. Those three things make us like God. When we are created in God's image and likeness, we are created as spiritual beings destined for immortality, that have the ability to reason and to choose freely. So that's what the foundation was laid last time. That then forms the, the basis for what we're going to talk about tonight, and that's forming one's conscience and choosing. That God giving us these things, giving us these gifts, He gives us freedom. We have the power now to choose. And We've always had the power to choose what is good. The error, the original sin, happens when we choose what is bad. Some people believe that there is a choice if you have opposites from which you can choose. This is good, this is evil. I have the power to choose good, I have the power to choose evil. If you are only presented with good, there is a fiction or a temptation or a lie of the evil one that says you don't have freedom if you only have the ability to choose good. And that's a lie. Because choosing evil doesn't make us more free. Choosing evil actually ensnares us and enslaves us and captures us. It's only when we have the ability to choose good that we are free. And that's what God gave Adam and Eve. He gave them the ability to choose what is good and what is right. The evil one got in there and twisted their thinking and said, Oh, wait, wait, wait. If you also choose evil, if you know evil, if you choose it and take it, then you're going to really be free. Because now you have something good, and now you have something wicked to, to decide between. But choosing that which is wicked does not lead us into freedom. It's like if, you, if you're in a locked room, and I give you the opportunity to choose a key, or to choose a, 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 a fish bone, which are you going to take to get out of the room? Well... Having the ability to choose a fishbone helps me in no way whatsoever. It doesn't help me to open that lock. It doesn't help me get out of there. So having that ability doesn't actually add anything. If I have the ability to choose the key, then I'm free. 
If you give me the ability to choose between the key and a fishbone, you have not given me anything extra. I still want the key to get me free. If you only give me the ability to choose the fishbone, now I truly am not free. So freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want. Freedom is not the ability to choose between right and wrong. Freedom is the ability to choose good. Freedom is the ability to choose the key. If you don't have the key, then you have no freedom. If you don't choose good, if you don't have the ability to choose good, you don't have freedom. Our conscience then enables us to know how to choose what is good. Can I de decipher what is a key and what is the skeleton of a fish? Can I figure that out? Conscience is the tiny little voice within, and we'll talk more about this, it's the tiny little voice within that points us in the right direction, that shows us the path to freedom. Freedom is not the ability to do whatever we want, not the ability to choose for, between extremes. Freedom is the ability to choose good. So if a parent, a teacher, a government, whatever it is, gives you the ability to do or choose what is good, you are totally free, completely free. Even if you don't have the ability to choose something that is bad, you are free when you have the ability to choose what is good. And that is a, that's a concept that's been really warped in our minds because the freedom, really today, I think people have it in their minds that freedom is the ability to do whatever I want or to have many choices or to choose good if I want it and not to choose, or to choose bad. But freedom really is just the ability to choose good. And that sets the foundation then for our moral theology and what conscience is. Because God has created the world good. He created us to be good. He creates us in a situation of original justice where everything is in balance. And then it's through the temptation of the evil one where we decide not to choose good. See, what Adam and Eve did was they didn't so much choose evil as they chose not to do good. They chose disobedience. Rather than listening to what God told them to be free, they chose something else. And in doing that, it alters their relationship with God and it alters their relationship with one another. And once that happens, it warps the way they think. Because now, everything's not so clear. It's not as obvious or as easy to determine what is actually good? I'm not so sure I know this anymore. And so God gives us a conscience, which if you just look at the word, the word conscientia, con science. Scientia, science, is a Latin word that means knowledge. Con is the word that means with. So we act with knowledge. Conscience is choosing with knowledge. This afternoon, I spent about an hour and a half with my ballot, looking up every single person that I had no idea who they were on the local level things, uh, elections, to see if I could vote for them and or if I could not and had to vote for the other person or if I had to leave it blank because in conscience, with knowledge, I could not give my little black dot. And so I went through each one in my, my iPad and looking up each person and looking at their records and looking what they stood for and looking what the, all that stuff because I wanted to vote with knowledge. I wanted to utilize my conscience. I wanted to listen to, to what I know. What is good? I want to choose the good. So our whole, moral, our whole moral life then is acting with knowledge. Because, and we said this last time, human beings are not just animals. 
We are rational animals. We are thinking animals. We are immortal animals. We're animals with souls that are meant to be immortal. And having, having that, I don't just make a decision and that decision doesn't have impact. For being a human being, since I have the ability to know, I have to use it. If I do not use my ability to know, then I am being irresponsible and perhaps sinful. I may, I may guess rightly, but that doesn't make me virtuous. Guessing rightly does not make you virtuous. Guessing rightly means, well, you accidentally didn't do the bad thing. But it's not that you actually did a good thing. To do a good thing is to do something with knowledge and to choose it. And so when we, 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 we inform our conscience, this voice that's within, the cartoons get it wrong a little bit. The cartoons often demonstrate conscience as the little angel and the little devil sitting upon your shoulders. Uh, the conscience would just be the little angel sitting on your shoulder. That's, that would be the conscience. The, the little evil guy, the little devil sitting on your shoulder, that's, that's your tempter, that's temptation. That's not conscience. Temptation is different than conscience. Conscience is true and good and beautiful. Always. Conscience is right. It is right knowledge. Conscience ultimately is that the Holy Spirit speaks directly to you. Conscience is the interior temple where the Holy Spirit is in conversation with you. Now there's a couple things to say about that because it can be very easily then to say, oh, well the Holy Spirit told me this. And the Holy Spirit told you that. And the Holy Spirit told you that. And he's telling all kinds of stories now all of a sudden. The Holy Spirit doesn't act like that. The Holy Spirit cannot tell you one thing and tell me another thing. So it's important to form our conscience so that we can hear the Holy Spirit appropriately. It's like, it's like think about it as the Holy Spirit is broadcasting on a certain frequency. And you have to turn the dial so that you can hear that frequency well. If you're completely off, or if you're on AM when you should be on FM, or on Sirius, <laughs> you need to find the right platform, first of all, that you should be on. I'm on FM. And then I need to find the frequency. What am I looking for here? I need to be on the right number. If I'm not on the right number, I'm not going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to hear someone else's voice. I'm going to hear someone else's words. I need to hear the Holy Spirit's. And that's something that everybody can tune into and everybody can hear. Everybody can find it. And we can kind of, sort of, sometimes get it and this is the danger zone. There's clearly the place where we're not getting it. I'm listening to some other channel. There's that place where I'm right on, perfect, locked in, crystal clear. But then there's that other place where it's kind of, sort of. I'm not like on the frequency. I, I'm on a few little point whatever's off, but I'm still getting it, but it's just a little staticky or scratchy. So I miss every other word or so. That's also possible. That our conscience can be well-formed, it can be malformed, it can be not formed at all. Our job as human beings is to take this gift that God has given us and to form it, to fine-tune it. Like, does it line up? Is this what I'm supposed to be hearing? How do we form our conscience? I know, that's what, I know that's what you're all asking. Okay, Father, great. I want to do that. How do I form my conscience? There's a lot of ways to form the conscience. Number one, and I would probably say the most preeminent, the most important way to form the conscience, is first of all, in prayer. 
you have to have a relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with God, you are not going to have a well-formed conscience because you don't even know what the voice of God sounds like. So there has to be personal prayer. Am I praying? Am I, do I have a regular relationship with God where I am opening up to Him and I am allowing God to say something in my life where I can start to see, oh, that's how you work in my life. Oh, that's what you're doing in my life. And that prayer, I think, is so closely related to the next thing, which is sacred scripture. That, that St. Jerome, uh, the Second Vatican Council, from beginning to end, the church has taught ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Jesus Christ. That if you do not know scripture, you do not know Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying picking and choosing your scriptures that you want to know. Well, I like this verse, and I like that verse, and I like this book, and I like that chapter. But it is knowing Scripture in its totality. How does this all flow together? So that if I read the Old Testament, and I read a part about God destroying the nations, that in the light of the whole of Scripture and how divine mercy and divine justice work together, I now know how to interpret that in the light of all of Scripture. No verse of Scripture stands on its own. It's to be read in context of every other verse of Scripture. And Scripture is to be read in the context of the tradition of the church. So that we're never left with this personal interpretive thing. Like, well, I read that verse, and this is what it means to me, and that must be it then, period. But we read this verse, and I ask myself, well, how does that fit with everything else that's in this book, or these many books that make up the Bible? And once I look at that, well, how does this fit into the 2,000 years of understanding of Scripture that the church has approached that? How does this fit with the whole of the faith? that we do not form our consciences on our own. The worst way you can form your conscience is to go take a year-long private retreat on the top of some mountain where you sit and stare at your belly button. <laughs> that is the worst way to form your conscience. You do not just sit there and, and somehow come to, to, to a well-formed conscience. If you isolate yourself and put yourself on your own, you will fall, and you will fall far. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. They sinned when they were not together. They sinned when they were separated. That the evil one got into the ear of the tempter, and rather than talking it over with Adam and bouncing this back and forth, she succumbed. And then she wasn't able to have a conversation with him. All she could do now was parrot the words of the tempter. Now she was in a relationship with him. She, he, was her new lover. I have found someone else, and now I can bring that to Adam and pull him in as well. And now they're both mingling with him. Conscience is not formed in isolation. Conscience is formed in the context of the body of the church. If we step outside the body of the church, our conscience will necessarily be skewed in some way, shape, or form. If we do not pray, if we do not read scripture, and if we do not adhere to the tradition and teaching of the church, then we are not going to have a well-formed conscience. That these are the paths to freedom. These are the paths of divine revelation. That God reveals himself to us through scripture and through tradition that is mediated through the magisterium of the church. And so as we, we take these fonts of revelation and we listen to those, that's what's going to give us freedom. And if I negate those or put those aside, I'm going to be missing a very important element to what gives me freedom. Prayer, scripture, the life of the, the living tradition of the church. 
These are things that help to form our conscience. Let me push the pause button right there and see if there are any questions heretofore. So, if we're supposed to study scripture, like, is there like a certain way, like, we're supposed to read these verses these days? Like, do we, how should we read scripture, like, if we want to put it into our lives every day? So the question is, if we're supposed to read scripture, how our study scripture, how are we supposed to do that in a way that, uh, in a practical in a practical way, like what is the way to do that? There's a couple different answers to that question. I think you can just, uh, you can begin just by reading it. Just start reading something, praying it. Maybe the daily, the readings of the day. Maybe the, the Sunday reading. Stretch them out over the course of a week. Spend each day on a different reading that you're going to hear on Sunday. Uh, begin reflecting on those. There are, there are a lot of helps out there, a lot of apps and a lot of publications that you can use to kind of help uh, start a daily meditation or reflection on Scripture. And then there are Bible studies, and there are youth studies, and there are things even online that you don't have to go to a group necessarily right away, but you may want to. You may want to do that in youth group, or you may want to do it in a circle of friends, or you get together uh, one evening a week or a month or whatever, and you, you study scripture together with a guide or with someone who's, who's knowledgeable or certified in these things. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can approach it depending on, on where you are on that journey. But I think starting somewhere is the key. That I need to incorporate scripture somehow into my life. Choosing a lesser good. I've heard the phrase, choosing a lesser good. Well, there's two ways, I guess there's two ways that I could uh, approach that. On the one hand, there is the, the concept of sometimes we are faced with choices that are not between two, either good and evil, but sometimes we're presented with two evils, or we're presented with two goods. And our conscience also helps us to navigate those paths as well. So in those cases, if I have two goods and I have to choose between them, the goal is going to be to choose the greater good, not to choose the lesser good. And likewise, if all I have are two evils, and I must choose one, then the object is to choose the lesser evil. If I must choose, then I have to choose the lesser of the two. So I guess that's, that, that's a, a moral, and I think we'll probably get into that as this year rolls on and getting into the, the details of moral theology, but there is that principle that the goal is always to choose the good, if you have two goods, obviously you would want to choose the greater good. And, I mean, St. Augustine speaks about this in his conversion story. He says, Lord, you created all these good things in this world, and I chose them. And I filled my life with all of these lesser goods to the exclusion of the greater good. You. I totally excluded you because I was content with all of these lesser goods. And then I found my life was not happy because I just kept choosing lesser goods, and I wasn't choosing the thing for which I was made. And so Augustine really reminds us that we, that we really must choose the greater good. Because the lesser goods, while they're not evil, it's not necessarily where God wants us to be. Father, there seems to be a popular sentiment today that maybe some are not less Yeah, so is there a, there, there seems to be a, a tendency to speak about people who do great evil as that person doesn't even have a conscience. And I think that's a linguistic that, that's troubling. It's like when you call someone a monster, 
or someone who has done a heinous crime or committed a grave evil, and you call them uh, a devil, or you call them a monster, or you call them inhuman, that we use language to take away dignity. And in some sense, to participate in a sinful mindset where redemption is not possible. And, and so that becomes problematic. And so the same thing is at work there, to say, well, that person doesn't even have a conscience. It's not that we really believe they don't have a conscience. It's, it's, it's almost to justify something or to, so that we can, can treat them or think about, well, I'll do the thinking for them. I need to, you know, push them out. What we could say, though, is that they could have a malformed conscience, that the conscience has been grossly malformed, that they are living in ignorance, and that that ignorance may be what the church calls invincible ignorance. And, and invincible ignorance is the inability to even know that you are ignorant, or the inability to even know that there are ways out of this or possibilities. That doesn't absolve a person. Because one of our fundamental moral responsibilities, having a conscience, is to form it. And if we have not formed it, and then do bad things, not only are we guilty for those bad things, but we are guilty for not forming the conscience that should have directed us away from those bad things. I may not be as guilty for the bad thing that I did, but I will be guilty for the not forming of my conscience. That that was equally important. So this might go along with that, but I've heard someone talk about if you persist in mortal sin, that it could lead to a darkening of the intellect. And um, I think that if I look at my life, there were times when I was doing things, kind of like you're talking about, where I didn't really know, like I persisted in mortal sins, I didn't know any better, right? Or it was because I kept tumbling down this, these bad choices, whereas I moved away from those, it sometimes gets better. And, um, but then again, when I think about like darkening of the intellect, I see a lot of smart people, maybe it goes back to some of the things we talked about earlier, those three things, um, I see a lot of smart people that, that, that choose immoral choices, but they're really smart. Yeah, okay, so the question, uh, if you didn't hear that, or the kind of the, the, the statement in the question was, uh, if the, the, when we commit sin, particularly mortal sin, what effect does that really have on our conscience? Because it, it seems that that may darken the conscience or dull the conscience, and, and then that affects the choices that we make, and, and, but, but, but then also there are really smart people out there who have keen intellects, which is the power of the soul, uh, but also make very poor moral decisions or choices or whatnot. Good transition. It moves us right into the next theme that uh, we want to talk about, and that is what happens when we don't choose what is right and good? It leads to sin. And what does sin then, what effect does that have on us? So sin is the choosing the thing that does not make us free, ultimately. Uh, St. Paul uses an archery term to describe sin. The word in Greek is harmartia. And this word that it means, it's basically an archer who misses the bullseye. That the arrow did not land where it was supposed to land. That is what St. Paul describes as sin. Sin is missing the mark. Missing the bullseye. I chose something other than that that I was supposed to choose. So sin isn't just saying, oh, I reject God. Oh, I'm going to walk over here now. Sin is, I'm not even careful where I'm pointing my arrow. And that is also sin. So sin is not just a rejection, but it's also a carelessness. Sin is both rejection and carelessness. And sin, then what, what happens then? I mean, you think about this in anything else that we do and anything else that when we do something that misses the mark and we do that over and over again, what happens? You build that muscle memory, you build that habit, you build that whatever, and you do it wrongly. If, if you try to teach yourself a golf 
and you don't have a coach there with you, and you are swinging, and you keep doing it over and over again, and your form is poor, you're going to teach yourself a poor form. And that's going to then be locked in, and it's going to be harder to break out of that, because you, have, you almost now have to unlearn what you learn. Same thing happens in the moral life. If we continually sin, whether we're choosing it, or even not choosing it, just being careless, the more we do that over and over and over again, the more that becomes a part of us, the way we think, the way we see the world, the way we make choices, we, be, we are changed by it. The, the same thing that happens with grace happens with vice. So habitual, habitual grace leads to virtue, Habitual vice lead, or habitual sin leads to vice. That you build up a habit for doing what is wrong, for choosing what is wrong, whether you intend to or not. So there is that. Also, like take for example, like a knife. If I'm not honing the knife with each use, or if I'm not sharpening it regularly, or if I'm using my knife and cutting on stone or putting it in the dishwasher or so it bangs against everything else, that knife is going to lose its sharpness. It's not going to cut like it's supposed to cut because I didn't treat it the way I was supposed to. And now this knife is going to be dulled. That's what happens to the conscience. The conscience has not been kept sharp. The conscience, when we sin or keep choosing sin, is, the conscience is no longer sharp. Our ability to know right from wrong is no longer keen. And so it's much easier to totally miss the mark, to totally harmartia that error, because I'm not able to see clearly. Everything is dull. So yes, a dulled conscience, which has nothing to do with being a smarty pants. Have, being intellectual, being bright, you know, being a great mathematician, or a physicist, or a philosopher, or even a theologian, having a lot of intellectual prowess is really about head smarts. It doesn't necessarily touch the realm of morality if I don't apply it to that. And I think that's the point where a lot of smart people don't apply uh, the same science of intellectual rigor to their morality but rather allow their morality to be guided by their irredeemed passions. That this is what feels better, or this seems right, or whatever. And so you can have someone who's really bright make really dumb choices, or believe really bad things. Some of the most well-intentioned people can do and commit some of the worst crimes. And in fact, I would say, it was said once, and I forget who said this, maybe it was uh, in the screw tape letters, but we haven't gotten there yet, if you're also watching that. But it is, even the greatest, the greatest sinners must have had a little bit of good within them in order to twist it into something horribly rotten. In other words, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That we always start with something good. I want this good. And then the poor choices, the, the, the malformed conscience, takes that good intention and makes all kinds of wrong decisions about it. Well, I can justify this bad thing for this good reason. I can justify this bad thing for that good reason. And there's always a good reason that seems to, in our mind, absolve the evil that surrounds it. So I think that that's what happens to the conscience when we engage in sin. Sin is a separating yourself from God. So, the two types of sin, venial sin, mortal sin, there's also original sin, but, but the two that we commit, venial sin, mortal sin,
Both of those sever us from God in some way. So venial sin uh, are those, those minor sins that damage the relationship with God, but do not destroy it. But that doesn't make it good. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we can continue to do that. A venial sin would be cutting off the microphones. You can still hear me, but not as good. And the more we allow this to persist, and the more I take a step back, and the more I talk more quietly, the less you can hear me, and the less we have a relationship. So getting into, getting into venial sin, uh, just because it's not serious, like I can justify a venial sin, that's messed up thinking. It's just messed up because I'm doing damage to the relationship. And just because it's not serious doesn't make it good. Mortal sin is totally killing the power, totally pushing the, the, the stop broadcasting button, totally throwing all of you out of here or me just walking out that door and, and not going on anymore that this relationship is over. I'm no longer going to have a conversation with you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call now. I'm going to go talk to that person and not to you, right in front of your face. So I'm just going to sit down here and have my little conversation. Well, how you doing? Oh, that's wonderful. That's awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Blah, 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 blah. Totally ignoring you. Our relationship is over, and you're not even a part of that relationship anymore. That's mortal sin. And it doesn't seem like I'm doing a bad thing. I'm, it doesn't seem like I'm doing a bad thing. That's the real nefarious thing about it. Again, we commit sin not because we know it's bad, but because it seems good on some level, either on the level of the intellect or on the level of the passions, that it seems good to do this thing, and then we follow that. But when we totally cut off, so if I'm still talking at you with none of the microphones attached, even in a, in a sotto voce, a quiet voice, you can still hear me, and there's still a relationship. That relationship is strained, and it causes more work, and you're going to get less because you're going to miss some of the important words, maybe, or you're going to not hear certain things that I'm saying, or I'm going to tell an awesome joke, and you're totally not going to get it because you didn't hear the punchline. There's going to be something that's going to happen. Uh, a mortal sin, there's nothing between us anymore. That, that that is severed. And now we have to do something to restart it. So a venial sin, I overcome that by rebuilding the relationship. Let me put the microphone back on. Let me amplify my voice again. Let me speak up and face you as I do that. Now we are restored. That was pretty easy to do. But if I turn the power off on the live stream, and if I walk out that door, I can't just pick up where I left off. I can't just start talking again. I can't continue the lecture in the parking lot. I can't just pick up where I left off. I can't just start talking in front of a, a phone that is not recording or broadcasting anymore. I cannot just pick up where I left off. Some action, some thing, some intermediary thing has to happen. I have to turn myself around and walk back into this building, come back into the spot, suit up again with all of the apparatus, and then push the button and wait for it to start, and then, okay, it seems like everything now is working again, and I apologize, and da-da-da-da. But there's a lot of things that were broken that need to be restored in order for that relationship to continue. Mortal sin. We can't just pick up where we left off. It requires the reconciliation that Jesus gave us in the sacrament of penance. Like, that's why he established that sacrament. Because he told his disciples, you must forgive the sin. And when he's talking about sin there, he's talking about this sin that separates them from him. That this is what you are there for. That you have, to, you have to apply the effect of the cross to that moment and jumpstart again what was broken. And restart it and, and attach that person 
back to the power and, and to bring that back to life. So there needs to, so that, I mean, that's why Christ gave us baptism, to do that with original sin. He gave us anointing of the sick to do that when we're not able to do it on our own. And he gave us reconciliation in order to do that when we are seriously sinful. You will notice that almost half of the sacraments are purely for the forgiveness of sins and the healing of the soul. Anointing of the sick, reconciliation, and baptism. And even Eucharist, even Eucharist has a healing element that is part of it. So more than half of the sacraments are solely for healing and, and, and fixing, nourishing what is broken and weak. That should tell us something, not to take it lightly, that this is what we are about. We are about bringing our consciences to the Lord, having them fed, nourished, so that we can make good and right decisions. So whenever we choose to commit sin, whenever we choose the not good, we are doling the conscience. Whenever we choose the good, we are honing it and we are sharpening it. And so it is possible for two people who were raised Catholic and who have done completely different things with their lives to have two different perspectives on what is right or wrong. And it's going to boil down to how did you form your conscience? Now, I'm not talking about legitimate differences, because there are legitimate differences. There are some things that are right and wrong, good and evil, that must be chosen between. And then there are those things in the middle that we can argue about, disagree about, and can justify one way or another because they are not clear. When it comes to economics, and economic policy. Uh, we can have different perspectives on what is right or wrong in setting up an economic structure to benefit society that is going to help the people that it needs to help and to build up strong foundations for all of the citizenry. You can have arguments about that. You can disagree wildly about how you go about building up a system that does that. What's right or wrong is that you need to care for the poor in whatever system you choose. Now, how you go about doing that is going to, that you can argue about. When it comes to issues about uh, life in the womb and whether or not that is that I can, I can take that life or not take that life, that is not a conversation that we can have. There, there is no gray zone there. That is either right or wrong. Murder is either right or wrong. Economic policy, you can argue, and that could change based on circumstances, based on situation, based on the part of the world that you're in, based on who you're dealing with, based on so many different things. So there are certain things that are definitely matters of, of right and wrong, and then there's a whole area where there's legitimate difference, and there can be. So let me stop there and just uh, see if there's any questions about what we've covered so far. So you talked about how you can get going on the wrong path. And it's continuing to do good So the question is, if, uh, if, if the continuing in a bad habit that leads to vice uh, dulls the conscience and prevents me from seeing or hearing God more clearly, and the real lived experience that 99% of us have, every time I go to confession, I confess the same repetitive sins over and over again, Am I dulling my, my own conscience and my sense of God's work in my life? How do I arrest that? How do I change that? What's, what's the advice? Here's my number one bit of advice, which I think is, it's really not mine. I think it's St. Ignatius of Loyola, so let's footnote him right here. <laughs> but here's my interpretation of St. Ignatius. St. Ignatius would encourage us to use the holy imagination. 
So again, we're using the powers that the Lord has given us, intellect, memory, and will. And that allows us to create things in our mind. So, the best advice that I can give for breaking out of vice or bad habit is if you find yourself committing some sin, saying some stupid thing again, doing some action again that you didn't want to do. Uh, maybe it was a relational thing. Maybe something happened at work. Maybe whatever you did, you realize later on that you said the wrong thing, that you did the wrong thing. Like, it, 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 you become aware of it. Like, oh my gosh, I did the wrong Or someone points it out to you. You know, you were really kind of being a jerk to, to her. She was just asking you what your coffee order was, and you were like, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, you, you know, you, you, you tore her down. And you're like, oh my gosh, I did do that. So, especially if you cannot immediately reconcile that. Like, I cannot go to that person right now and reconcile that. The, the, the practice, the spiritual practice that we do is in your imagination, you create that scene again. You put yourself in that scene. You put yourself before that person. You hear what they say to you, and you imagine yourself saying or doing the right thing. And you choose in your imagination to say and do the right thing. And when you do that, you create a new memory that is going to then displace the old memory of what, what you did in real life. So, in a sense, you do the work of expiation. You atone for that. You make remedy for that, even if in your mind. Because what you're doing then is you are going to build a new habit of making better choices so that the next time a similar situation rolls around, the first memory in your lineup is not the sin, but is the virtuous response. Now, that's not a guarantee that you're going to choose and do the right thing. But if you do this over and over again, this is something that, again, sanctifying grace and the power of the imagination. This is why St. Ignatius calls it the holy imagination, because it is your world in which, like God, you get to create. And you can create and make decisions and choose things in your imagination that can leave their impact upon your memory and your will. So it becomes, it becomes like shadow boxing. You're practicing, and then when the real one comes, you know what to do. So that, I think, is that's, that's how I would respond to that. And that's why an examination of conscience is so important. A daily examination of conscience. That before I retire each day, I make some examine. Like, I need to go through. My, con my conscience needs to speak to me and I need to look back at my day and judge my actions and my relationships. And if I can atone for them in my holy imagination, I need to do that. I need to pray for forgiveness. I need to go get forgiveness if that needs to happen. And that examination keeps the conscience sharp. If I do not examine my conscience regularly, the little things get missed. And when the little things get missed, then the next little things get missed. And then the next little things. And so this is why it is good to have a regular examine and even a frequent confession, even if you don't need it. Even if you don't need to go to confession technically because I'm, I'm not aware of any mortal sin, some regular habit of confession because it forces me to examine my conscience in a fuller way to dig out those things. And if I only do it sporadically... I'm just not going to be aware of sin. That I will be able to say something flippant to someone and not even realize that I said that. Because I'm so used to doing it without being called on it. And if someone else doesn't call me on it, I at least need to call me on it. That's what the conscience is for. I need to hear God's Holy Spirit call me on it. So if I'm not examining my conscience, calling my jerky actions, well, then I'm going to get stuck in them. Well, 
bit off the track. I remember seeing a movie called In Cold Blood about two men who kill an Iowa farm family because they thought the crooks they had money. So, and at their trial, the judge said, neither one of you individually were capable of doing this, but together you formed a third personality. Now, something like that, can that explain some of the depraved stuff that goes on in our world? Um. I've been following the Bailey Boswell trial. Oh my God. Okay. The compounding of sin. So the question the, that, that if you have individuals who maybe in and of themselves would not have committed a crime, would not have committed a sin or done that thing, but when they got hooked up together, all of a sudden, like a new personality took over and they were capable of committing that sin. And absolutely that is, that is the case, because this is why, a little bit of a sidetrack, this is why the Lord Jesus desired to join us together by His Holy Spirit to form one body so that we were not left on our own, because the more you surround yourself with like-minded individuals focused on Christ, all wearing the mind of Christ, that, that there is a strengthening then of virtue and those good habits. Likewise, if I associate with those whose maybe negatives amplify my negatives, so the hope is in the Christian community that our positive, if you look at your positive and negatives as, as a wave here, and you have the, the peak and the trough, that here, if our peaks just keep amplifying one another's, where that gets strengthened, that is going to help lead us to live a good life, to make good choices. But if I associate with those who have similar trough tendencies as I do, those troughs are going to be amplified and take me to places that I didn't necessarily want to go and I didn't think I could go. But there was this amplification of sin that now has taken personal sin and made it communal sin. You will notice that in the one place in Scripture where Jesus actively condemns someone to hell, it is not an individual, it is a nation. The parable that Jesus uses in Matthew's Gospel, he, it says, well, on the last day when the king comes again, me, not me, Jesus Christ, <laughs> he comes again, the nations will appear before them, before him, and he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And to those on his right, he will say, you clothed me, you fed me, you cared for me, join me in my kingdom. To those on his left, he will say, you neglected me, you didn't visit me, you forgot me, get out of here, go to hell. He says that to nations. There is a collective sin that can be diabolical. And there is a collective virtue that can be grace-filled. No one of us gets saved on our own. We are saved as a community. We are saved as a body of Christ. We are saved as a member of the church. And no one of us really, I think, is condemned on our own. We are condemned also in those whose company we kept. And so I would, I would proffer that as yes, absolutely. And this is why it is so important to watch the company you keep. Not just in terms of the friends you hang out with, but what's the television I let into my house? What's the internet that I let into my house? What's the conversation, the books, the, what are those things that come into my house and come into my mind? Whose company am I keeping? And what effect does that have on me? Particularly if it begins amplifying the troughs in my life. And I get drawn to those television shows that really speak to the dark shadow of my person. 
it's going to amplify those. Or if I hang out with those people that amplify that shadow in my life, that's going to pull me down as well. Absolutely. Let's say my parents have two children, and they raise them both the same. You've heard this story. And, and I turned out wonderful, and my, my brother did not, for instance. Um, can we, can we, is it too simple, too simple to say there's a lot of bad choices made or a lot of good choices made between the two people that, that when you turn into adulthood, that's where they end up? Uh, asking the question of you've got two children, and we could even, let's even bring that even tighter together. We've got twins, identical twins, that are raised by parents at the same time in the same situation, and one turns out really good and one turns out really bad. Is it, is it all choice? Is it all... I mean, it kind of goes back to that age-old question. Uh, are we the product of nature, nurture, a combination? And, and I think it, it, it's all three of them. I mean, it is, it is... We are definitely a product of our, our nature. That there are certain chemicals that... You, I mean, you may have a chemical imbalance. There may be a mental disorder. There may be something within the brain that was not formed. And so the power of the soul is not able to communicate in this world, in your body, as well as it could or should. And so are you, are you culpable for that? Not necessarily. But do you make poor choices then because of that? Perhaps. Uh, there could be nurture. The, again, kind of going back to lo what, what Louise said, that the company that you keep, the experiences, the environment in which you are, that plays a huge import on who you are and who you become. Uh, and then your own personal choices. Do I continue to make good choices that, that build me up? Do I continue to make bad choices that tear me down? I don't think it's a, it's a super easy formula because, I mean, we are complex creatures and there are so many variables that, that are coming into play here. This is also part of the reason why Jesus says, do not judge anyone lest ye be judged because you have no idea and the bazillion variables that led to that person's decision how much, how free they were in making that decision. And so whether or not they did a bad thing is a different question from whether or not that bad thing is, or they are culpable or guilty for it. Those are two different questions. Just because you do a bad thing doesn't necessarily mean you're guilty for it. There may be something it was totally out of your control. So in the, in this time when the church is very focused on mission and evangelization, and you're talking about all our press or jobs, we want to go out there and we want to interact with people in an evangelistic and missionary way, but at the same time, you're saying that we watch the company. I'm wondering if so if we're supposed to be evangelists and missionaries and go out there and bring in all that we can in, in a missionary way, and yet to watch the company you keep, um, I, I think we just have to follow the example that Jesus laid down, that he gathered those core apostles together, and they were the core. They learned from each other, they supported one another, they never went out individually, they go two by two. And so there is a constant support structure. They go out, they evangelize, they mission, um, but they don't stay out there. They come back to the 12th. That is their core group. They go out, they do their work, they come back and process. They go out, they do their work, they come back and process. And I think that's what we do too. Jesus went to the homes of sinners and had dinner there, but he didn't move in with them. He called them then to his table. So you go to those places, you go to those people who may have totally different lives, but you don't move in with them. You invite them then to come into your home and to spend time with your circle and to be in your community. And so I think that's the, the key. Okay. 
So I think that kind of wraps us up for tonight. That was, that was on the agenda for tonight, the forming of conscience, the, uh, the choosing right and wrong, and the importance of, of community that either strengthens or detracts from that. And uh, this, uh, this, this train will keep moving as we continually uh, unfold, well, how do we know right from wrong? What is God's revealed law? And how do I begin to process that and deepen it in my own life? So let's conclude with uh, our final prayer and call it a night. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Next month, November, I believe we're scheduled for the 13th. Uh, that date is likely going to change. So uh, keep an ear out for the date change on that. I think I am not here that Saturday. So we're going to have to change that. Or I'm going to have to remote in. Have a good night. Thank you.